Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ray and welcome to our video tutorial series on Objective-C data types. In this video tutorial, we're going to take a look at floats. Okay, so floats are the data types you use for floating point numbers, in other words, decimal numbers like 3.14, 123.456, and so on. They're also really useful to represent very large numbers because of the way they work internally, which I'll show you in a moment. You can represent humongous numbers like 1.34, times 2 to the 60th. Now there's various options you have for creating float data types. The first is called float and that's going to be defined as it uses four bytes to store that value whether you're running on a 32-bit or a 64-bit OS. Double is a double precision float so rather than four bytes it uses eight bytes on both a 32-bit and 64 OS. Now just like Apple has their own data type for integer they also have their own data type for floats that you'll see used a lot called CG float. And that's defined to be four bytes on a 32-bit OS and eight bytes on a 64-bit OS. So you can see it would be a mistake to cast a CG float as a float because on a 64-bit OS they'd be using different uh, sizes and it would corrupt the value. So there are similar best practices as before when you're deciding which of these types you should use. If you're interacting with Apple code and it uses CG float, you'll see this a lot in core graphics especially, then you should probably define your own variables to also be CG floats. Another good reason to use CG float is if you want the most optimal precision on the platform. So 64-bit OS's work really efficiently with double precision floats, so you might as well use them there. If you want to specify precisely what you need, that's a good reason to use regular float or double. Or if you have portability concerns, in other words, you're trying to write a C or C++ library that you can use across OS's, that's another good reason to use regular float or regular double. Let's take a look at how floating points work internally. So the way they are encoded is they have a bit for the sign of the value, positive or negative. Then they have this value called the mantissa. I like to think of that as the significant digits for the value. And the important thing to understand about this is it only has so many bits available to store this mantissa, depending on whether you're you know, using a, a four-byte float value or an eight-byte double value. Only a certain number of the bits inside there are used to store this mantissa. So this is going to result in some potential rounding errors, which we'll talk about in a bit, and I'll demonstrate quite a bit. So you take that significant digit and you multiply it by a base. Now this base is always going to be 2, because computers work most efficiently in powers of 2. And then you raise that power of 2 by an exponent. So let's take a look at a couple examples. I found the easiest way to understand this is to use this online conversion tool, the link you can find down in the links below. And I find this a really good way to understand how a decimal number is encoded as a float. All you have to do is type in the decimal representation here, and it will display what the sign is, in this case 1, what the mantissa is, in this case it's 1.0, and what the exponent is, so it's 2 to the 1. So in other words, it's 1 times 2 to the 1. And what I like to do is just verify this for myself by putting it inside the calculator. So I mean, it's obvious, but just to do it this way, 2 to the 1 is obviously 2, and if I multiply that by 1, I get 2. Makes sense, right? Let's try another value here. I'll put in 42 this time, and now I get 1.3125 times 2 to the 5th. Let's try that out. So 2 to the 5th is 32 times 1.3125 equals 42. Cool. Let's try a different one, and let's try 0.1. So it turns out that 0.1 doesn't represent itself very well as a in binary form. So you can see here that this number, the mantissa here, is 1.6, a bunch of zeros, and then a bunch of other values here. And this would actually keep repeating, but there's only so many bits available to store, you know, a floating point number, so it has to cut it off at some point. So it's not actually 100% accurate representation here. Um, so let's see what happens. So the exponent is 2 to the negative fourth. So if we do that, then we get that's equal to 0 0.0625. And if we multiply that by the mantissa times the mantissa, then we get almost 0 0.1. You see here there's a little bit of uh, an error down here, and this causes uh, problems when working with floating points if you're not careful. So let's take a code demo and dive a little bit deeper into this. Okay, let's make a single view application, and we'll name this hello float. I'll just save this somewhere to my hard drive. Okay, I'm going to open up app delegate and I'm just going to work in application did finish launching because as you know that's a good place to put sort of test code. 
So let's make one example of each of the three types of floats that we can use. So first there's float, and we'll set this equal to pi. There's a nice built-in constant called m pi for that. And we'll also make a double. We'll also set that to m pi. And we'll make a CG float as well. Next, we will log out each of these values. So it turns out whether you want to log out a float or a double or even a CG float, it's always percent %f. And we just pass in that value. So let's repeat this real quick for the other ones. And another thing I'd like to do is print out the number of bytes that each of these take. So we'll do that just as we did in the integers video tutorial. Okay, now let's run this. Right now I'm running on a 32-bit OS. And we get a float is 4 bytes, a double is 8 bytes, and a CG float is 4 bytes. Now if I run this on a 64-bit OS, I'll see that the CG float is now 8 bytes. Now, one thing that you do commonly when you're logging out float values is you want to sometimes control how many digits to print out. So say you only want two digits to print out for each of these. If you put a 0.2 modifier before each of these values, then it will only print out two digits. So the default is to print out six digits, but say we want to double that and print out 12. Now we have a lot more digits displaying. And now you might notice something interesting here. The float is the float version of MPy is different than the double version of mpy. And again, that's because doubles have more bits to use to store the exponent values and the mantissa, so they're going to be more accurate. So you're actually getting a rounded value, and, and slightly erratic value of mpy here, because float only has you know so much it can store about that. So let's see what the exact error is. Cast the float as a double and subtract that. And, you know, I want the absolute value of that because it could be positive or negative. Now, if I run that, I see that there's an error on the float. It's a rounding error, so you just have to keep that in mind. So let me show you a few gotchas that will happen when you work with floats. Here's a common one. So say you want to make a value for one-third. Here's the wrong way of doing it. That seems right, right? Well, if I log that out, I actually get zero. So why is that? It's because one and three are integers. If you were dividing one by three as an integer, it just truncates the result. So it's gonna be zero in the end. So what you need to do is you need to make those actually floats. And the easiest way to do that is just put a point zero at the end and they are now uh, floats. Run this now. Then now I get the, the value that I expect. Now let me show you another common gotcha, and it's comparing two numbers. So say I have an initial value of 0 0.1 that I want to build up to. And let's say I set my float to be initial divided by 3. And then I'm going to just do that, I'm going to add to that initial divided by 3 two more times. So you would think that if I compared initial and I compared float, they should be the same, right? Because I've taken one third of the initial value, added it, you know, together, and it should be the same. But watch what happens here. If, if I do f equals initial, I will log out match. And if they don't match, no match. Okay, if I run that, it says no match, even though you would think that they should. So let's log out a few things to figure out what happened here. Let's log out the value of f, and let's log out the value of the uh, initial value. And finally, let's log out the error. Okay, if I run this, I see that f is this value and initial is this value, and they're actually not quite the same. There's a error difference. So as you work with floating point values, the more you add and subtract and basically work with them, a little bit of error accumulates, and it kind of depends on um, 
the size of the values you're working with as well. So it's not accurate to just test if they're equals. There's a better way of doing it. Now I'm going to show you another way that's not quite right, but it's a step in the right direction. So what we want to do is we want to, instead of testing if they're equal, we want to subtract the two and say, you know, if they're basically close enough, then they're equal. So we'll call this close enough value a tolerance. And one, you know, initial way to think about doing this is there's actually a value defined for us called float epsilon. And that's defined to be the smallest value between one float and another. And you might think, well, you know, that sounds like a good, nice, small value to use. Uh, why don't we compare against that? So let's see what happens if we try that. So we'll now switch this to f abs to absolute value of f minus initial is less than tolerance. Okay. So now it says match. Uh, let's log out the tolerance too. Okay, we see the tolerance is is this and the error is less than the tolerance, so that's why uh, it says we're okay. But that doesn't always work because uh, it depends on sort of how many operations you're doing with the float, you know, and we happen to be okay here. But let me show you another example that wouldn't quite work. So let's set, uh, let's instead of, you know, making three hard code iterations, let's make this a loop. And let's make a lot of iterations. And uh, we'll figure out how much to step each time by just dividing the initial value by the number of iterations. And we'll set f equal to zero, get rid of this code. And we'll say for int i equals zero, i is less than iterations, plus plus i, we'll say f plus equals the step. So, okay, so this time, look what happened. We got no match, first of all, so that's bad. And that's because we've done a lot more operations, the errors have accumulated, and now our error is greater than our tolerance. So it doesn't work. So let's try another step here of trying to get this to be better. So instead of just having the tolerance be float epsilon, let's multiply it based on how many sort of operations we're doing on this float. And um, in practice, you know, it's not always easy to know how many operations happen on your float, so you may you may have to either make a guess or do some testing to figure out what's what's right for your use case here. But we happen to know in this use case, so we can just plug that in. And uh, so we basically have increased our tolerance a bit higher and the errors within the tolerance, so we're good again. But guess what? We're still not perfect here because look what happens if I take that initial value and I make it a big number instead. So instead of 0 0.1, which is a small value, we're going to make it a, a million. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and we'll keep the iterations as the same here. And if I run it again, once again, I get no match. And why is this? It looks like the error is bigger. So it turns out that when working with floats, the error that accumulates, it depends on the size of the numbers that you're working with. So if you're working with larger numbers, you're going to be accumulating a larger amount of error. So it's not enough to just guess at a small number like float epsilon, because what may seem small uh, to you, it, it kind of depends on the, the number. And, and it goes the opposite way too. If we were working with really, really small numbers, the float epsilon might be too big. Um, so we have to multiply this by basically um, something related to the value. So we're going to do uh, the values combined together, initial. So in other words, we're going to be increasing the tolerance for larger numbers here. And uh, so for tolerance of a million, uh, for numbers like as large as a million, we're making the tolerance to be 316, uh, the errors within that range, and so it's a match. So uh, this is just scratching the surface on floating point comparisons. There's literally entire blog posts, multiple series of blog posts written on this topic. So for now, I just wanted to make you aware of mainly it's not as easy as just testing for equality when working with floats or even just using float epsilon. There's more to it than that. And let you dig into it yourself. All right, so that's it for this video series. We want to end this off with a little challenge for you. So one of the things that people say about floating points is you shouldn't use them for currency. And you might wonder why not?
So let's do a little test. I want you to add this code to your project. There's a few areas in here that are question marks. Replace these with the proper code to get those to display out properly. Then I want you to run this code and it's not gonna work the way you would expect. It's basically simulating somebody has $100 in their account and they're transferring 10 cents to somebody else's account for 30 days. And basically you run those transfers and then you log out the two accounts and you log out the sum and the sum's not equal. So I want you to think to yourself, why not? And if you don't understand, either rewatch this video or check out some of the resources in the links below. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I'll see you next time.